All right, hello physicists. The beginning of a new unit. Today we're going to introduce capacitors, which is the beginning of our circuits unit. Now, it's going to start out a little bit abstract, but once we get down to the nitty-gritty of, of calculating uh, things in circuits, this becomes much more straightforward. So, since everything is going to depend on the electrical potential, because that's what we are good at measuring using voltmeters. Let's just review one thing, okay? Now you'll remember when we when we uh, worked our way up to the electrical potential, we went through the electrical potential energy, then we took one particle away, then we think, thought about the uh, the the <laughs> electrical potential as being something in terms of um, joules per coulomb, so the amount of energy that you would get per extra piece of charge. But let's not worry so much about that today. Today we just want to worry about electric fields and how they can be described using the electrical potential. Okay, so remember the electric field is taking the, uh, the partial derivative uh, of, the, uh, of the electrical potential. And we have a minus sign that tells us that the electrical the electric field is pointing from high potential to low potential. So just to give ourselves a, a little bit of review, you remember in our lab last week we tried this, we had a piece of conductive paper and we had an, a plus electrode and a minus electrode and we would chart out the equipotential line so that was the line where the voltage was the same all the way around and the places where the electric, uh, the, the equipotential lines are far apart is where our field is, is weak. So like out here, the place where they're close together is where the field is strong. So that would be like close to the electrodes. And every point along here, the electric field is pointing perpendicular to the equipotential. So you can tell exactly what direction the electric field is pointing at that uh, on that equipotential line and the electric field is strong where the equipotentials are close together and far apart where the uh, the the electric field is weak where the uh, equipotentials are far apart so this this dipole case would go with that okay now, to make this a little bit more quantitative, here's an example where it asks, you've got point Q and uh, P and Q separated by a distance of 0.1 meter. The potential difference between the points is 55 volts. So remember, the uh, electric field, in uh, if you have a constantly changing uh, electric potential, is minus change in voltage over change in position. So, um, for instance, this electric field is pointing to the left in this picture, so this would be higher potential, that would be lower potential. So if, if this was, you know, zero volts, this would be 55 volts, and the electric field would be pointing from the higher potential down towards the lower potential, and if you wanted to find the magnitude of that, it would just be the change in voltage over the change in position, so that would be 55 volts over 0.1 meters or 550 volts per meter. Okay, um, this can work with many particles. Uh, so for instance, in this problem, it says you've got a bunch of different points for three charged particles, there's your plus uh, charge, minus charge, and another minus charge. It asks, what is the direction of the electric field at the location of D? Well, remember, electric fields are pointing in the direction that a plus charge would get pulled. So in this case, our plus charge would want to get pulled over towards this minus Q. So we can tell that it would be pointing like this, and it would be perpendicular to the equipotential line since all electric fields in these uh, electrostatics problems work that way. Now today we're going to introduce the idea of a capacitor. Now if you wanted the simplest version of a capacitor, essentially what it is, 
is going to be a conductor and then some kind of an insulating layer so you could put an insulator in there you could also just have an air gap and then another conductor and then you put a little wire on each one of those sides and that is your capacitor so here's a here's a picture of that um, for an open air <laughs> gap conductor that's not the most um, most useful but it's good for good good conceptually usually they'll have some kind of an insulator in there and they'll roll them up like a jelly roll um, now the purpose of this this device and the reason why it's good conceptually is that um, it is a way to store a lot of energy and if you want to dump a lot of energy into your circuit quickly you can do that by having a capacitor that stores up some charge. So the the equation that defines our electric or, or our capacitor is this Q equals C V, and this C is called the capacitance. And V is the voltage that's put across the uh, the device. And Q is the charge. And so the way to think about this is that some plus charge is accumulating on one of the conductors, so like one side of this these plates, and a minus charge is collecting on the other side. Now I want you to notice that so there's something a little bit confusing here. Um, you'll remember when we had voltage, we had V for volts, and the unit for that also was volts. But right here we have C for capacitance, but the unit of capacitance is not C coulombs. The unit of charge is coulombs. So this is charge. V is our potential difference. Okay, so we have charge, capacitance, and potential difference. And this is electrical potential, and so there is some sort of an electric field between these plates, and that's really where um, the bulk of the energy uh, from putting the charges on there is, is held. Now the units on capacitance, well, since capacitance is charge, coulombs, V is volts, it's got to be coulombs over volts, which is the unit of capacitance. We give this a new name, farads, you know, it's after Michael Faraday, the uh, the English electrochemist who uh, in, helped to invent field theory. Um, and the interesting thing here is that if you if you think about well, okay, that charge is that a positive charge or is it a negative charge? The answer is either one. You've got a plus charge on the plate that's connected to the plus side of the battery, a minus charge on the plate that's connected to the minus charge of the uh, side of the battery. That, that is if you close the switch and wait for a bit. And so the overall charge on a, on a capacitor in normal functioning is going to be zero. But on either side of the capacitor, it might be, uh, you might have some net charge. Okay, so this Q is referring to the charge on either side of the capacitor, and we're not, um, at the moment, being very fussy about whether we mean plus or minus charge. One type is on one uh, of the plates, and another is on the other. Okay, so just uh, to keep, keep this conceptually clear in our heads, if you had a little capacitor, they usually look something like this, where you've got, as I said, they're uh, rolled up like a jelly roll, and it would have that 11 microfarads written on it, okay? And so how much charge is on the plates of a 11 microfarad capacitor that has been connected to a 120 DC volt uh, power supply for a long time? So in the way that you draw this in a circuit diagram, you draw a battery as one long line, one short line. You draw a capacitor as two long lines. In a circuit, you know, you're going to have some alligator clips and you connect up like this and 
you're going to have maybe have a battery like this. So there's your battery. You know, <laughs> this looks more like a three volt battery, but we're claiming that this is 120 volts. Okay, so if you have a plus side of your battery and a minus side, the uh, the the plate that's connected to this wire coming out will have a positive charge. The plate that's connected to that one will have a negative charge. And overall, the charge on each one of those is going to be C. So 11 times 10 to the minus 6 farads. And remember, a farad is a coulomb per volt. And then the volt is going to be 120 volts. And that's going to give me my 1.3 times 10 to the minus 3 coulombs. Okay, so that's referring to a positive charge on uh, the side that's connected to the positive end of the battery, a negative charge on the side that's connected to the minus side of the battery. Now, to try to refine this idea, how would you calculate the capacitance of a simple geometry? So that's what we're going to try next. Let's try to calculate what sort of capacitance we would get if we had a big plate of charge on the bottom and a big plate of charge on the top. And we're going to model this through the same sorts of ways that we, we use to model the infinite plates, but we're going to sort of try to sneak in uh, that this is really an approximation for big plates. Big in the sense that the separation between the plates is much smaller than the size the the you know size of one one edge of the plate okay so what are we going to do well first off we're going to find the electric field then from the electric field by integrating it because the derivative of our potential is our electric field if we integrate our potential our electric field we can get back our potential difference so we're going to use the integrated electric field to find our potential difference. And then once we find that potential difference, we're going to use C, Q equals CV to try to infer what the capacitance is of a metal plate separated by some gap and another metal plate on top. All right. So let, we're, we're trying to get here where we find that the capacitance depends on the area of the plates and the distance between the two plates. Okay, so let's just rehearse our argument. So first we're going to find our electric field. Now here's a nice drawing uh, to help you think about it. Now you'll remember from our discussion of the semi-infinite or of the infinite uh, plane of charge that that didn't depend on spatial considerations. Okay, So if you just had a big plus plane of charge, uh, the electric field would be pointing up and it would be pointing down and it wouldn't die off in space. So we can use that approximation if our plate is big. Um, and I'm being a little sloppy here. Okay, And so the idea here is that we're going to have a plus charge and a minus charge. And because both of those have electric fields that are not dying off in space, effectively out here, the electric fields are point, uh, contributions are pointing in opposite directions. So the electric field outside um, the capacitor is going to be zero. Inside the capacitor, let's find out how big it is. Well, consider that this is a box. Okay, so we're thinking of something like, here's your plate of charge, and now piercing through the plate, I have some, you know, a box or a cylinder or something like that. Now up here on top, the flux through the top is going to be zero because the electric field up there is zero. The flux through the sides of the box is also going to be zero because the electric field is pointing at an angle of 90 degrees. And you'll remember the flux depends on the dot product of the uh, area vector coming out of the surface. So they would be coming out like this or like this uh, and the electric field. So the electric field is pointing down as in this picture, uh, it's going to be at 90 degrees. So the sides don't contribute to the total flux either. What does contribute to the total flux is that bottom. 
So here, let's say that we have some area and if we wanted to find the flux, it would just be the area times the electric field times uh, the cosine of the angle between the two. And if the cosine of the angle is just, um, if, if the area vector for this is coming out like this and the electric field is also going there, the angle between the two is zero and the cosine of zero is one. Okay, so that's our flux. Now we have that epsilon naught times that total flux through our surface is going to be equal to Q, the charge contained in the box. Now let's just leave that as Q and we can put this in now for our flux. So epsilon naught times A times E, the electric field strength, equals Q. And so if we just solve that, it's going to be that the electric field strength is Q over epsilon naught times A. And remember, epsilon naught is just a number. It's a, it's a measured value that has to do with um, the K in Coulomb's law. Okay, so there, there's our electric field. We used Gauss's law. Now we're going to find the voltage. Now, if you look here, the voltage difference between the two plates depends on the dot product of E, the electric field, and the, and the, uh, the integration uh, path that you take from the minus plate to the plus plate. Now, since we're going to go up from minus to plus, we're going to be going uh, opposite the direction of the field. So the dot product is going to depend on the cosine of 180. And so we're going to pick up an extra minus sign. So the V that we're talking about is this V final minus V initial here. And it already had a minus sign, but we're picking up another minus sign. And so we're going to use the plus. So the V that we care about here is going to be plus E D Y I guess and we're going to go from 0 to D there's Y equals 0 to Y equals D okay now if E was a function of space if it was changing in this region we would need to be a little more careful and uh, all the other examples that they do in the book do uh, include that. But here we can be a little cavalier and just write in Q over epsilon naught times A dy. None of that depends on our Y. And so we can just go ahead and integrate that. And it's just going to give us D minus 0. And this V is going to equal Q d over epsilon naught times a. Okay, now we're going to infer what our capacitance c is going to be. Now you'll remember that q equals c times v. That's how we define the capacitance um, of a setup that's charged. And here we have a setup that is indeed charged. And so if we have V equals Q D over epsilon naught times A, we can go ahead and let's solve for Q so it looks like this. So we can say Q equals, and then we're going to have what? Epsilon naught times A over D times V. Now, I want you to notice that this has the form of an equation with capacitance in it. Q equals CV, Q equals epsilon A over D times V. So what we do now is to infer that this must be the capacitance. C equals epsilon naught A over D. And that's exactly what we were looking for. Now you could do this trick with a, a number of other geometries. You could do it with a you know, a cylindrical rod surrounded by a shell of charge. You could do it with a sphere surrounded by a, 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 a spherical cell of charge, uh, shell of charge. 
You could even have the size of that outer sphere go to infinity and, and have the capacitance of an isolated sphere. In that case, you could just uh, connect the charge sitting on a sphere and its voltage. But regardless, the thing to notice here is that if we just have air in here, okay, so we don't have any, any extra um, atoms, you know, we're, we're pretending that air acts almost like the vacuum, okay, inside and outside. These capacitances just depend on the geometry. So this depends on the length of your cylinder, it depends on the inner and outer radii. The sphere also depends on the, in, the radius of the inner sphere and the radius of the outer shell. Um, okay, so that, that is sort of an interesting and uh, significant result. Now let's do a little problem with this. We found the capacitance of our parallel plate capacitor. Let's use that to do a problem. Okay, so it says we start out with a parallel plate capacitor with area A and plate separation D. Okay, so D is how far these two plates are from one another. And now we connect them to a battery of voltage V and it's charged. Okay, so this has a plus side and a minus side, so this is going to pick up plus charges. The minus um, bottom part is going to pick up minuses. Now, the second part of this question says, if the capacitor is then isolated and its plate separation is increased to 2D, what is the potential between the plates? Okay, so we're going to take off this V and somehow without messing up the charges, that's going to be hard to do, but we're playing pretend. So this distance was D. What happens if we move the distance between the plates to a uh, distance of 2D? And this still has my plus charges on it, and this still has my minus charges. Then they ask, what is the potential difference between those plates now? Well, when you started out and ended up, you still have the same amount of charge on either plate. How much charge? Well, luckily, we can calculate that in the first case because Q will equal C, which will just be epsilon naught times A over D times V, whatever that initial charge was. Now, over here, I'm also going to be able to use Q equals C times V, but my C will change because the D changed, and my voltage might also change. So let's see. If our Q stays the same, we can put in this, epsilon naught A over D times V equals, now for my new capacitance, the area of the plates didn't change, but the distance between the plates did change. So this is going to be epsilon naught times A over 2D times V prime. Okay, now you see where I'm going with this. I'm going to divide out all of the common things on either side of the equation. So my D's go away. Whoops, not my 2. The 2 is the only thing that matters. So there's the 2. Cross out my D. And then I can solve for my V prime. So my V prime, that's my new voltage, is going to be twice the old voltage. Okay, so that makes sense. The capacitance went in half, the voltage doubled. Now for this problem uh, from your homework, this is a, a homework problem that I gave you. I want you to notice that they're asking for which one of these plots goes with which one of these parallel plate capacitors. So that you can have different areas or different separations. Now all you want to do here is put in this area for the area and then put in this separation for the separation. And then notice that this is a Q versus V graph. 
So what that is, is basically Q equals C times V. What is C in this graph? It is the slope. So the one with the biggest slope is going to be the one with the biggest capacitance. The one with the smallest slope is the one with the smallest capacitance. All right, sort of a cute problem. Very nice. Now, to use these in circuits, one of the things that's going to help us out is to realize that for these kinds of electrostatic circuits where we're waiting until everything is kind of calmed down, if we don't have any current, that means we don't have any electric field. Okay, so if, if we have a situation where we have a battery, there's our battery, and here's our capacitor, the battery essentially is going to start charging and uh, discharging. I mean, really, the minus charges are going the other way, but uh, we don't need to get too confused about that until the electric field contributions from this side are canceled, are canceling the electric field contributions of the battery itself. And at that point, you don't have any more uh, electric field, the charges stop being accelerated, and you have an electrostatic situation. Now, if your electric field is zero, that does not mean that the potential is zero. That just means that the potential is the same all along each one of these wires. Okay? Now, you'll also notice something about this where if we have a voltage here, it's balanced by the voltage there, such that the voltage in this direction has to fall in that direction. And uh, an analogy that I'll be pushing harder on next time is that this is sort of like a, 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 a water wheel that provides pressure, and here the pressure falls as much as it was raised. Now, one of the classic things to do with capacitors is to combine a bunch of them and treat them as a single capacitor. So nice different ways that you can combine uh, components in a circuit. This is a parallel combination. So essentially you have a wire connecting uh, directly to the two sides of your capacitor in your first case your second capacitor and your third capacitor. So those, those, uh, those, those capacitors, all of their plus sides are connected with a wire straight to the battery. Uh, you know, this, they could be intermediary wires, but, but that doesn't really matter so much for this case. So the voltage across each one of those capacitors is the same. So this is called a parallel setup. This is called a series setup where you have one capacitor and then the minus side of that capacitor is connected to the plus side of the next one. The minus side of that one is connected to the plus side of the next one. And then the minus side is connected to the minus side of the battery. So this is called the parallel uh, configuration. This is called a series configuration. Parallel, well, it kind of looks parallel. Series, one after another. And something that we're going to do now is ask the question, well, what happens to the overall capacitance of that group of capacitors? And I suppose if you're asking that, the next question might be, okay, what was it that defined my capacitance again? Oh yeah, Q equals C times V. So, the question really is, if you apply a voltage, how much charge is going to be um, building up on all of those plates that are right next to the plus. How much of the charge is going to be building up on the plate that is next to the plus? And uh, it's it's a little bit different for each case. So let's let's think them through separately. Okay, so first off, let's think about capacitors in parallel. Each one of these is directly connected to the battery, so they all experience the same potential difference. Okay, so in parallel, the capacitors all experience the same potential difference, but they don't each have the same charge. Okay, so the potential difference is the same, the charge is different. 
Now what happens if we want to treat all of these as a single capacitor? What do we find the capacitance is? Well, let's let's uh, let's derive it. Whoops. Okay, so when we uh, do our capacitors in parallel, let's just draw the situation. There's our our voltage source. That's our potential. And let's just claim that we have a capacitor C1, a capacitor C2. And notice I'm drawing those as two parallel lines and a capacitor C3. Okay, now the thing to notice is that each one of these has the same potential applied across it. So they will have the same V across it, but they will not have the same Q. So there's Q1 minus Q1, Q2 minus Q2, Q3 minus Q3. Okay, now if you wanted to find out the total amount of charge, you'd just have to add up the total here. So you'd have Q equals Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. But we know that these all have the same voltage across them. So we could write, because Q equals C times V, we could write this Q just as C1 times V. Okay, so I could write this Q equals C1 times V plus C2 times V plus C3 times V. And because the voltage is the same across each one of those uh, capacitors, now we can, uh, we can factor out that V. So Q equals C1 plus C2 plus C3 times V. Well, that looks a whole lot like our old Q equals C times V equation. So what I do is I say, well, all three of these capacitors together are acting like a single capacitor. And we could say that that is a capacitor with C equivalent, U EQ here is for equivalent resist, uh, capacitance of C1 plus C2 plus C3. Okay, so we have a bigger capacitance. That means we're going to store more charge overall when we keep adding more capacitors in parallel. Okay, so here it says capacitor B has one half the capacitance of capacitor A. How does the charge on capacitor A compare to that on B when the two are connected in parallel uh, with the battery for a long time? Okay, so we have A and we have B. They're both connected in parallel. And in this case, the, uh, the capacitor B has one half the capacitance of capacitor A. So this has C. For B, it would be one half C. They s both experience, however, the same voltage. And we know that because they're both connected directly to the battery by an equipotential uh, wire. And so the Q on A is just going to be C times V, while the Q on B is going to be one half C times V. So how does the charge on capacitor A compared to the, that on B when the two are in parallel with the battery for a long time? A has double the charge two times as much charge as charge B. Okay, well, let's think about it in series. Well, this is quite a different situation because remember that our, our capacitor is essentially a, a conductor, an insulator, and then another conductor. And because of that insulating layer, the charge cannot move through. And because the charge cannot move through, if this whole wire is neutral and there's a charge on the, the top plate and a charge on the bottom plate, that constrains the charge. So if I know that the charge on this one is Q, the charge on my second capacitor has to also be Q. Remember, the total charge on the capacitor is zero, but when we talk about the charge on the capacitor, we're talking about the plus Q 
cube minus q on the two sides. So for capacitors in series, the charge is the uh, same across each one of these individual capacitors and uh, it causes overall less charge to build up. So let's just see how that works. Okay, so here's our um, C1, our C2, and C3. And they're each connected in series to a battery V. Now the voltage, if you just took a voltmeter and measured on both sides of this and, and, and checked, you would not necessarily find the same voltage across each one of these uh, capacitors. And they're also not going to necessarily have the same, or, or sorry, not the same voltage, but they are going to have the same amount of charge because the charge separation there ultimately has to be, whoops, got my signs wrong there. So this is my plus side. So this has to also be plus and then minus, plus minus, plus minus. So the charge on each one of these is the same. Q plus Q minus Q plus Q minus Q plus Q minus Q. Now, the interesting way that we're going to be able to find the overall equivalent capacitance where if we treat all three of these as a capacitor together is that the voltage from the battery here is going to be the sum of these three voltages okay so it's going to be the sum of v1 plus v2 plus v3 and I realize I haven't, uh, I haven't justified this very well. So we'll try to make that make more sense in our next video. Um, but if you'll, if you'll go with me on this, and it, and it seems sensible because voltage is a type of uh, electrical pressure. If you bring the pressure up, the pressure drops, the pressure drops, the pressure drops down to zero. Um, the, the, the amount that the total pressure is, is raised should be the amount that it drops. So. The, the, if, you, if you want to think about it in that analogy, it's sort of like a, um, you know, a water wheel or something like that going around a, a little indoor waterfall. You can think of it that way. Okay, so in this case, how do, what do we do next? Well, V1, Q equals C times V. So I can write V in terms of Q and C uh, for each one of these. So V equals, this would be Q over C1 plus Q over C2 plus Q over C3. Now the reason this is nice is that the Q is the same in each one of these and it factors out. So this would be Q times 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3. Now we would again like for this to be in the in the uh, form Q equals CV. So I would have Q equals one over one plus C1 plus one plus C2 plus one plus C3 times V. This ugly looking thing is our equivalent capacitance. All right. The way they write this usually is 1 over the equivalent capacitance is 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3. Just because <laughs> it's a little, having stuff in the denominator in the denominator looks a little, um, looks a little crazy. So just to give ourselves a little practice with this, here's a problem. If you have three parallel plate capacitors, each having a capacitance of one microfarad, okay, so this is one microfarad, one microfarad, one microfarad, they're connected in series. The potential difference across the combination is 100 volts. So there's 100 volts. What is the charge on any one of the capacitors? Okay. So you could do it like we did this last one where essentially you break up the voltage 
and then um, you find this Q. That's fine. I think an easier way to do it, given uh, that we already worked out the formula, would be 1 over C equivalent is 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3. So that would be 1 over 1 microfarad plus uh, 1 over 1 microfarad plus 1 over 1 microfarad. So 1 over C equivalent is going to equal 3 over 1 microfarad or the equivalent capacitance is going to be uh, one third of a microfarad. And then if you wanted to find your Q equals C times V, for your whole circuit, you could go ahead and use the C equivalent. So our Q for our whole circuit is going to be one third microfarads times 100 volts. Okay, so that's going to be approximately 33.3 uh, micro coulombs. Farad times volts is a coulomb. Micro just sticks around. Okay, so we are going to be uh, doing this in lab this week, and it should make a lot more sense um, once you've done that. So, what have we learned today? Capacitors store equal amounts of opposite charge on separated conductors. The capacitance of a capacitor whose conductors are separated just by air only depends on its geometry. There's no other factors. Uh, in real life, that's not what happens because usually you have another conductor in there. But thirdly, capacitors in parallel will store more charge from the same applied voltage. Capacitors with series will store less. And that means that the equivalent capacitance from capacitors in parallel will be larger than the capacitance of each individual capacitor. The, capacitance, or the equivalent capacitance of capacitors in series will be less than any of the individual capacitors involved. Okay, so thanks for watching and we will go more deeply into these subjects in our next video.